Okay, we're back open to op reconvene to open session. In closed session, um, the board voted to reject claim number 2022042921 in its entirety and authorize the superintendent to send a letter of rejection to the claimant. The vote was 5 0. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Farkas for the first time. <laughs> All right, Pledge of Allegiance, ready to begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. on to communications and recognitions for the Board of Trustees. <coughs> Trustee Jones? Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, Dr. Farkas, welcome. Rana, goodbye. <laughs> you know I'm only teaching you about being a traitor. <laughs> but maybe. <laughs> uh, but I do want to have us take a moment of silence tonight for one of our former teachers from Central. Miss Marcy Tansley. She was a French teacher and a Spanish teacher. She was at Central for about 30 years. And when she passed away the other day, her funeral was Saturday. And I got so many positive comments on Facebook about how they loved her, how they looked forward to seeing her and being with her. Anyway, I'd like us to take a moment of silence if we can, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, summer's here, folks. Stay hydrated, stay cool. That's all for me tonight. Thank okay. you. Okay. Move on to Trustee Peinado. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> Welcome, trustees. I'm your superintendent, um, Dr. Farkas. So I just want to thank all the teachers um, and the staff that are working with our students this summer. Um, summer school, we know it's not easy to wrap up the academic year and then pivot, turn around and do summer school. So I really appreciate um, all the support of all our district and our students. Um, and then I'm happy to see that the ARC program is continuing over the summer. Um, I think, I know that summertime activities are very limiting, um, especially for those um, families that are n unable to leave to, to cooler places. So it's really nice that our students continue to have that option over the summer. Um, I want to congratulate Laura Avila. She was the Southwest High School Outstanding Cal HOSA State Leader from the recent conference. So um, Laura is also going to be the incoming Southwest High School HOSA president this next year. So I want to do a shout out to the HOSA program and especially to Laura. And then lastly, I just want to thank Coach Stephanie Niebla from Southwest High School for her years of service as an Eagles girls softball coach. I know she recently announced her retirement as coach, and she led the Southwest Eagles to win the school's first CIF SDS title in softball in 2018. So I just want to send a thank you to her um, for all the service to our district. And then, of course, to Rana Fox, thank you for everything, Ms. Fox. That's all. Thank you, President Osiris. I also want to um, thank um, Ms. Rana Fox for everything she's done for our district. Um, we're very proud of her and wish her the best of luck in her her new um, assignment. Um, I also um, I was going to mention um, some of the well, pretty much everything Trustee Cunado mentioned about the the whole. So very proud of them. Um, they attended the the Nashville workshop and um, Nashville. <coughs> Tennessee. Um, I also want to um, welcome Dr. Dr. Farkas. Um, he has some big shoes to fill, and um, I have faith that he'll lead our district to where it needs to be. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Trustee Hernandez. Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, it's nice we're hitting full stride in summer, summer school. I, I'm teaching summer school right now. I know the high school's finishing summer school next week. So I'm very excited for that. And I'd like to, again, welcome Dr. Farkas, the first official meeting as a superintendent. Very exciting stuff. 
good discussions. I look forward to working with you um, for these next months. And I, you know, I think the district's gonna be going the right way just from the discussions we've had, so I look forward to it. And also, Ms. Fox, congratulations. Now, in person, we congrat congratulations on superintendent at Brawley, and I know they're gonna be in good hands from what I've seen and from discussions as well. And you know, from what I've heard from you as a principal of my mom, right? You're a principal of my mom and my parents, so uh, congratulations, and I know you're gonna hit, you know, hit the ground running, and, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be great. So they're very lucky to have you. Um, and then also uh, Ms. Petter, as right now the interim uh, assistant superintendent. So hopefully, you know, hopefully there's a lot that you're learning, and uh, <laughs> get, have fun being an interim superintendent, assistant superintendent. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have you here. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate it. And also, I just wanted to echo in terms of the last one that I said that, again, summer for everybody, um, take the time also to reflect just of what, you know, the pros and cons throughout this school year, wherever you're going to go, what you've learned from the district, if you're going on to somewhere else, and stuff of what we can do. And this is a moment of time to reflect and also to take care of yourself, right? I think sometimes we get caught up in all the work and everything that's changing, and we never take time to actually take care of ourselves mentally and physically of just you know to be ready for the next year and i think uh, sometimes we take that for granted so i hope everybody especially admin teachers everybody after summer school the ones that are working summer school take that time to take care of yourself and do what you have to do and especially with family friends etc and i hope you guys have a, a great summer thank you i appreciate it thank you uh for myself uh welcome dr farkas <laughs> hold on <laughs> just hold on because we've got a lot of work to do <laughs> Rana, I know that if we cut you, you still be, still bleed Spartan blue. I don't care what anybody says. Um, and for Shana Fitsurka, yes, um, she won an award for yeah. FFA leader. So I want a big shout out to her. Um, Stephanie Niebla, um, I don't want to say she'll be a loss because she'll still be a teacher and she'll still be here with us, but she'll be a loss to softball. And I mean, we're going to feel it. So. But, you know, retirement, and, and I know that she'll, this is what she wants. And uh, for Hosa, for Laura Avila, that was awarded the, the state vice president, was it? Anyway, but she'll be our incoming president. And, of course, state leader. State leader. But she'll be our local um, Hosa president. But none of this would be available or uh, here today if it wasn't for Ms. Valadez. She's an extraordinary and, and you need to really meet Ms. Valadez because it's not just Hosa, it's like her whole life is Southwest. So thank you very much. And thank you to all the teachers. And you mentioned ARC. It was, it's hilarious because I have a little nephew that never, like hates school, right? Hates it. And he said, oh, I'm doing ARC and we're doing real good. And maybe turn around a couple of times, like he really likes it, you know? So thank you to the ARC program. Um, that's it. Keep hydrated. Keep safe. Uh, keep safe with COVID. We've had a humongous surge in this week. So um, everyone, please. Uh, we'll move on now to superintendent's report. Dr. Farkas, you're on. Um, good evening, President Garcia Ruiz, uh, trustees, and everyone in attendance. Thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for listening. Um, wow. I guess my report starts with wow. I am... Uh, I'm on day five, finishing up tonight with you all, um, f uh, my first five days. Um, Ms. Carol Taylor, my secretary, uh, got me started, and they even mixed in um, a wonderful welcome luncheon, um, a belated birthday. They found out my birthday was last week, so they, uh, they surprised me with the ice cream cake and a little celebration. So um, just thank you to everyone for the first five days. The guy with the big shoes, Dr. Andreas, he, um, he drove me around in a district van um, for three days, two and a half days before he left for his new journey. And the district vans are set up at least the one I was in, where you don't really have a passenger seat. So he was the driver, and I was behind him. And I said, boy, after our first few stops, this is better than the Jungle Cruise. <laughs> I had an opportunity to get first-class tour of all of our district facilities and meet numerous people. If there's a quiz, I would have trouble with every name. And every single person was just wonderful to meet, shared a little bit about their program and their school, both principal, all, I'm sorry, all four principals walked us around their school um, buildings and sites. Um, so I just wanted to thank Dr. Andreas publicly because it was just gone above and beyond. Instead of wrapping up and leaving some folders, 
He took me to every single location in this district and didn't really miss anything. And then pretty much went to his U-Haul and left from there. <laughs> and, um, just um, first class and, and class act. So I'm very uh, fortunate to be following somebody with those kind of shoes and that is that wonderful of a leader that has gotten us to where we are as a team approach, of course. Um, again, I'm amazed from the very beginning when I studied about the district before my interview, I'm amazed with the facilities, the programs, and now especially more than that is the people. The people here have been incredible. Um, I saw Central's band in action for their last day of band camp on our, um, on our tour. I toured the STEM building as well. Um, incredible. Like some of those machines in there, I have no idea how to even turn those things on. It was so high tech and so amazing for our students. Um, so exciting to see when that building's in action with the kids in August. Uh, met students at actually in the classrooms at Desert Oasis finishing their last week of school. So that was pretty nice to see. I had my blood pressure checked at the adult school and learned about the um, nursing program and the uh, this uh, Mount, uh, Mount Signal program. And then, of course, I was able to see the ag facilities and the HOSA areas at Southwest. Um, just fantastic. Um, so I just wanted to say I was thank I'm very thankful. Um, it's really apparent how the Central Unified employees welcome not only a new superintendent, but pretty much from what I've seen and felt, any new person that comes into the district, whether it's a new student or a family member um, that just needs a little bit of attention. So I am uh, blessed and fortunate to be working with a district that treats each other and that treats our students and our guests with just incredible uh, warmth. Uh, I wanted to shout out to Superintendent Fox, Ms. Petter and Mr. Preciado for their um, hard work on this LCAP, you'll hear a little bit more in a, in a little bit about. Um, they went to the um, Imperial County Office of Education just when you thought the LCAP was finished. They still had to go back for a work session that took the majority of a whole morning last week and then came back and just kind of went back to work and finished up some things you'll hear about tonight. Uh, incredible dedication. And again, just like I said to, about Dr. Andreas, Ms. Miss Fox is a superintendent ready to go on her next chapter of her career and still s puts the brakes on to finish the LCAP with just uh, incredible professionalism and dedication to this district. So thank you, Superintendent Fox. Um, now our attention turns to the summer construction. Um, we have some meetings coming up and improvement projects, filling our vacancy positions, and then also planning for the return of our employees as summer goes quickly. Um, we're going to be um, planning purposeful professional development for many different staff classifications, obviously some teachers, but also there's other positions as well. And finally, to wrap up my long report, I just wanted to say um, just congratulations to everyone that's uh, been through this journey for Central over the years. Um, it's in a great position, and again, there's no um, magic uh, potion or magic wand. We're going to continue the hard work, and it's going to be based on teamwork. And we have enough programs and systems in place to just um, continue to uh, enhance them and staff them with the right people so that our students get that first-class education. Um, and again, a school is about beautiful facilities, but it's also about the people that are serving at the school more importantly. So I'm just honored again, ready to start the new school year. I know people are saying probably quietly tone it down. We want to enjoy some summer. So, and then we'll start and I completely uh, uh, respect that and hope that everybody enjoys just a little bit of uh, downtime with their families and friends. And that's all I have. Thank you. We move on to public comment. Do we have anyone? online that has submitted? No? No? Okay. So public comment on non-agenda items? No? Giving everybody an opportunity? No? We move on to approval of agenda. So moved. Motion by Ms. Jones. I'll second. Second by Ms. Peinado. All in favor? Aye. 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 We want to consent agenda. 
items, all items appearing on the consent agenda are routine business matters and will be acted upon by one motion without discussion. Should any board member request that an item be considered separately, that item will be added to the end of the regular agenda. Does anyone one wish to move? No? Do I hear a motion? So moved. Jones. Second. I'll second, Ms. Garcia. Mm -hmm. Have a motion by Ms. Jones, second by Mr. Hernandez. All in favor? Aye. 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 Go on to action item. Approve the 2021-2024 CUHSD Local Control and account Accountability Plan, including the supplement to the annual update to the 2021 to 2022 Local Control and Accountability Plan. Mr. Mayor Garcia, right mm -hmm. before you vote, I do have a, a short presentation of the changes that were made between our the um, last meeting. Yeah, our okay. public hearing on the 14th, which mm -hmm. Director Anderson did an amazing job with, and um, today. Okay. So Tricia and I and Rosanna and I um, met with ICOE twice. We met with them um, Thursday of last week and then we met with them again on Friday. And this was their time to give us the review of our LCAP and, and give us some feedback on how to strengthen our LCAP, but most importantly, how to make our LCAP less vulnerable. By that they mean making sure that our actions are, are for our targeted groups and as you know in our, in our LCAP we're focused on three specific groups. Students learning English, students who are foster youth and students who are low income. And it's very important that the money in our LCAP, that supplemental and concentration, focuses on that group of students. So we've done a lot of hard work, Trisha and I. Um, thank you for all your help. So one of the first things that they commented on was the budget. So we, I think when Dr. Andrews presented um, the LCAP on the 14th, he mentioned that we had a 42.74% increased in improved services, meaning that 42.74% 4% of our LCFF base dollars had to be, um, would, we would be given an, an additional amount of money for our supplemental and concentration dollars. So 30.24% is uh, what our target from the state was for 22-23. On the LCFF calculator, that was a percentage we were given. However, from our 21-22 LCAP, we had a 12.5% carryover which was roughly about $5.5 million, I wanna say, of unspent money from 21-22. So at that time, we had a, an increase in improved services of 40.7, and they had said, uh, or 41.4, excuse me, and they had said that that was fine, that we could simply say we're going to um, spend the additional dollars in our 23-24 LCAP. Well, when we met with them on Thursday, they had just come from a meeting at Sacramento where they had said no. You, your LCAP must show your entire increased and improved services per percentage um, to the dollar amount. So we had to go back and revise our LCAP to show the 42.74%, which is roughly $18 million. So you'll be able to find that um, in pages 118 to 122. But just to give you an overview, these are the changes that we made. So in goal uh, five, action two, which is our goal for um, basic services, really centered around safety, um, qualified teachers, and safe facilities and instructional materials, we had had a lot of requests from our sites for creating calming rooms or sensory rooms, right? We noticed coming out of COVID that a lot of our students that are unduplicated had a lot of mental health issues, and they really needed a safe place to go. So we've added funding in goal 5.2. We've moved it away from being funds for repairs of facilities and shifted it into funding for safe non-threatening spaces. So funds for the creation of calming rooms and sensory rooms on each campus and we increase that goal amount to around $400,000. So about $100,000 per campus um, and additional expenses for calming rooms and sensory rooms. In goal uh, 1.14 which is really our CTE, that's our CTE facilities action. We included a money for the CTE pathway at Desert Oasis. At this point in time, we're unsure what pathway will be at Desert Oasis. Our first responder teacher had resigned. Uh, we were looking at design media and visual arts. We we're unable to find a teacher. We then went to CNA. Uh, we're still looking for a teacher and possibly there's a retired um, sheriff's deputy coming out of Westmoreland that might be able to do something in the area of law. So we're still unsure what that program is going to be. 
But regardless of that, if it's not first responder, they need equipment, they need um, industry standard uniforms. So we put some money in 1.14 to improve the facilities there for whatever pathway comes aboard at Desert Oasis. Um, in goal 1.4, one which is another CTE goal coming out of uh, goal one, which is improving academic achievement through instructional strategies and programs. Uh, we had not previously funded the CTE CTE teacher at Desert Oasis, so we went ahead and added the funds in for the CTE teacher and put a little bit more additional funds for our farm and our health resource center. Again, trying to supplement that. In goal 4.2, which is the creation of a community school atmosphere, we added some additional funding for more computers and furniture in our parent education and engagement centers that we're hoping to open on each campus because our parents have told us that going to the central location is not always feasible for them because they do not always have transportation. So we're looking to replicate many resource centers um, at each of the uh, sites. 4.7, that's our targeted foster youth and um, homeless student services. We added some additional funding there. So beyond the 47,000, we're getting in the ARP HCY grant and the, one, and the um, set aside of Title I. These are additional funds specifically for foster youth. Goal 5.7, again, under our basic services safety, we added additional funding for ARC for travel, snacks, and overtime. Sometimes they like to do cooking classes, and if they use our kitchens, we're required to have our own food services personnel there, so we added some money um, to supplement ARC. And in 1.6, um, we added additional funds for ELO opportunities. The ELO opportunities we did last summer were well attended. I mean, our teachers love teaching those extra courses that were not always core courses so we put some money in there to allow them to continue to do that and then it, under goal 5.1 we added additional funding for carol and her team to recruit teachers from underrepresented groups part of the lcap and part of the legislation and, and really even in title two it says are you recruiting teachers from underrepresented groups marginalized communities and when they say things like that they're really looking at are you really trying to reach out to your black indigenous and people of color are you reaching out to them in, in, in magazines that serve those communities? Or are you reaching out to the universities that are predominantly black or predominantly Native American and indigenous? And so that takes money to do that type of recruiting and advertising. So we went ahead and added additional funding there to be able to do that. Really with the goal of our teaching population representing our students so they can see themselves in the people that work with them. We're a little bit lucky in Imperial County as we're predominantly Hispanic here, but we do, have, we do have students that are Indian. We do have students that are African American. We do have students for some of the Asian, um, Asian Hawaiian, and would it be nice to try and find staff that they could see themselves in those, in those as well. So those are the revisions in budget that I brought to you because they're substantial revisions, right? It was an additional um, $1.4 million that we added to our LCAP. Again, to reach that goal of 42.74 increased and improved services. Um, we, they asked us to add our low income percentage, which was 74.9. You can see that on page 15 of the LCAP. We had our unduplicated count there, which is 74.6. Um, and so they just said we need to also add our low income percentage. So we added that there on page 15. In goal one, um, we in prompt, each goal has four prompts. It, it talks about um, different things. One is um, what are the substantial uh, differences in, in what you budgeted and what you actually spent, which is prompt two. Uh, what was the effectiveness of the actions you did? How has your LCAP changed? So they added, uh, they asked us in goal one, which is increased academic achievement through instructional programs and intervention strategies to explain the uh, material differences between budgeted and actual expenditures for those actions. And you can find that on page 45 of the LCAP. They added us to add a metric for priority seven, broad course of study. We had a metric for priority seven, but it's centered only around CTE. And so state, the state requires us to do a metric for broad course of study. So we added one specific to um, the number of marginalized or un underrepresented students in our CTE uh, VAPA and um, advanced courses because we've done some work in our board study sessions where we see that our students with IEPs, um, our students that are learning English are underrepresented in some of our visual and performing arts, some in AVID and in some of our advanced courses. So we added a metric around that. I mean, you can see that here. This is the metric. ELs and students with IEPs take a mandatory support class that prevents them from taking electives, CTE courses, or VAPA courses, and they often represent less than 10% of the total. 
So our goal, uh, this was our baseline for this year. That's a percentage of total number of students enrolled in visual and performing arts courses willing, uh, that's where we are. Students with IEPs, 5.7%. Uh, students learning English, 13.2%. Foster youth, 0.4%. Homeless, 2.1%. And migrant, 5.0%. So this is our goal for 20, uh, 2020, 23-24 would be to increase the percentage of students enrolled in visual and performing arts. Um, so, um, so students with IEPs were going from 5.7 to 10 percent. Uh, our ELs from 13.2 to 15 percent. Our foster youth from 0.4 to 1 percent. Our homeless from 2.1 percent to 3 percent, and then our migrant from 5 percent to 7 percent. So, how are we calculating which percentage you want to increase? So, when I really kind of looked at how many students were 5.7 percent, and then I said, you know, for example, um, and I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but let's say we had. 20 students with IEPs that represented 5.7%. I figured over the course of the next couple of years, if we added five more, we would hit, and that's roughly, then it would be at 10%. So I just kind of went adding numbers of students. Otherwise, the percentages were random. Yeah. Yeah. You extrapolated. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And really, if you're looking at statistics, Maria, anything over 2 to 3% is statistically significant. Now we can, um, if we want to relook at this, um, if we want to relook at this outcome and we want to actually look at numbers here, then Trish is able to do that. We can revise that and we don't even, we just have to bring it back as information. Okay. So we had to have a goal. We kind of worked with this and this is where we landed, but it definitely is something, it's a living document, so it can be revised at any time. It can be up or down or yeah. hopefully mm -hmm. more up. Okay. And we'll look at our year two outcome and maybe we'll hit those in our year two and then we can, we can then change them. Mm-hmm. So also uh, in goal two, which is um, academic achievement through uh, professional development, they wanted us to provide an explanation of any changes in the goal and outcome. We had to provide an explanation for changes in the goal, in the metric, in the outcome, and in the actions. So in this particular goal, I had only described the metric and the actions, and I needed to go back and describe the goal and outcomes. That's on page 66. And goal three, which was all about Mount Signal Virtual Academy, they, we, they had some additional actions. They wanted me to explain the difference between the budgeted and actual expenditures. That's on page 72. Also in prompt four, we had to provide an explanation of any changes in the goal metrics and outcomes. Um, I really only did the actions because it was our first year with this goal. So I simply had to go in and say, there was no change in the goal. There was no change in the metric, no change in the outcomes. So goal five, which is again our uh, basic services, uh, we had to revise it to specifically support increased and improved services for unduplicated students in action two. Uh, we, it was pretty generic and it looked as if it was supporting all students, but remember your LCAP has to support your unduplicated students. So I had to revise that. Um, and we added a new action. So this is the new action, safe and non-threatening spaces. This is the verbiage. Provide calming rooms and or sensory rooms on each campus to support student mental health connectedness and social emotional well-being. These safe spaces will include flexible seating, sensory items, and items to help students who are experiencing a mental health or social emotional crisis. Generic enough that we can, you know, purchase what we need to make it a safe space. That's on page 94. Also, action three, again, we had to revise it. We had an issue with our goal five in that they felt like the way it was previously written wasn't specific enough, right, Trisha? It wasn't specific enough to say, what are we doing above and beyond for our low-income foster youth and students learning English? Because some of the things we had in there, they're like, oh, facilities repairs? You have to do that for everybody. That's not above and beyond, right? So we had to go back and revise some of our actions to show how they specifically were meeting the needs of our unduplicated students. Um, we added action three, campus safety. So this was a hot topic item with the county. The ACLU is really um, against any type of law enforcement or police in LCAPs. Those are trigger words for them that will bring them in to question your LCAP or to, uh, to review your LCAP, and that's happened to some districts here in the county. So Action 5 was about our SRO, it was about our security officers, and they really cautioned us that that made us very vulnerable because it, it, it didn't say what we were doing above and beyond. Like, how was that additional services for our students? You know, and keep in mind that we're always wanting our, we're always wanting to make sure that all kept reflects above and beyond services, not core services. So we revised it, Arnold and I, and Trisha worked on this one, and so we, 
Revise it, uh, provide a safe campus by providing staff to supervise on campus in common areas. Assist in prevention and identification of trends in drug, alcohol, and tobacco use. Provide support, guidance, and intervention for students who are experiencing behavioral difficulties that interfere with their learning, belonging, and sense of safety. House a student services office dedicated to school safety and school-wide discipline policies and practice. Provide a vehicle for each site to provide transportation to parents and students in case of an emergency and to allow the community liaisons and other staff to safely conduct home visits and welfare checks. So we really revised this action to center around the overall safety of our students. Um, just because uh, the way it was written was, was a lot of core services and that's not the, um, that's not what your SNC dollars are to be funded by Arnold. Yes. Right. We were we were um, we were advised to remove it. However, Arnold and I, in in my focus groups, in all of our surveys, um, we had issues with safety come up from our classified staff, from our certificated staff, from our parents, from our student focus groups, um, from our community. That they really wanted more more security. We needed more safe campuses. Uh, and especially, uh, we have our students in 11th grade, I w I'm gonna butcher the number, but I wanna say 60% of them said that vape was readily available to them. You know, we had high numbers of 11th graders, you'll see in the local indicator report, that have used drugs in the last 30 days. Drugs are available on our campuses, and that safety feature for parents is so important, which is why we felt, based on our educational partner feedback, that this goal had to stay in there because it's what our parents were asking for. It's what our parents of low-income students, our parents of students learning English were asking for, for additional safety measures. So we really felt strongly that if we were writing an LCAP that was based on our educational partner feedback, this, this action had to stay in. Now this wasn't from the county, it was from the people of Sacramento? Well, from the County Office of Education, getting, we, we their, getting their guidance from Sacramento, yes. And they don't know where we live. I want to just I just want to put out that the county is very helpful to us and they are our partners in case Doreen's watching um, I'm not <laughs> mad at Doreen I'm not mad at Doreen I'm not mad at Claudia and I'm not mad at Robin it's just they're doing their job to make sure our LCAP it does the best for our students that it's supposed to do so yes um, also in prompt two we had a few other actions they wanted us to explain the differences on um, we had to provide an explanation and changes in goal metric and outcomes there hadn't been any, but I just have a, I just simply said no change, no change, no change. Uh, we this was a piece that we this is a piece Dr. Farkas is referring to that we worked all morning and then probably till about five o'clock on. In your increased and improved services, you have to have what they call a strong through line. So with that strong through line, you have to show that you have a unique need. That unique need leads to your actions, and then you have to show how you're going to judge whether or not those actions were successful. So we revised some of our buckets. We went from eight buckets to seven buckets, um, or themes in our increased and improved services, and we moved one from uh, being a school-wide into being limited, and we went through each one of those buckets and we said, what is our unique need? What, what data do we have that says these actions are needed in our district? What um, focus group data do we have? What surveys do we have? What does our academic data say? So we had to go through each one of those and ensure that there was a strong line from the unique need to your students who are low income, students who are foster youth, students learning English, directly to your actions, into what your outcomes, how you're going to judge that. What is the outcome? What are you hoping to improve with these actions? So we really did a lot of work strengthening those sections. And that would be the end of the revisions. Are there any questions? Okay. No questions, but I do have a comment. I love like that you're adding the sensory rooms and all mm -hmm. the extra CTE at De Desert Oasis. I just, that's something that was really needed. Yes, so. and luckily we had the additional yeah. funds we had to spend, so we're able to go back and, and revise those, so. Yes. Again, our, our LCAP you'll see is around $18 million. Um, <coughs> You know, with a lot of other money coming from the state, I just want to say, uh, Arnold and I and Trisha discussed it, that you should anticipate we'll probably have carryover at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. um, $18 million is a lot of money to spend, but they're going to do their best to <laughs> spend it. But from now on, what you'll see is you'll see the SNC coming down on the LCF calculator probably in the 30s, 
whatever our carryover is, so it's always going to be an LCAP that's above and beyond what we're given that year because we're bringing the carryover in to the new year. I, I really like it, and thank you yes. for that presentation that it's very, it seems to be very student focused, yes. and that's yes. really what we want. We want the those academics um, success. Ultimately, that's the goal. Yes. Um, one of the things that Dr. Ward had previously discussed um, was making the mariachi program at Southwest High School and bringing it under CTE. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that process actually started or have there been a uh, thought process regarding how that would look in the future? So we began the conversations um, regarding a um, visual and performing arts pathway. Mm -hmm. Uh, with that, things could fall under that. Uh, it was just in general discussions this year because um, we focused our time and attention on building our biomedical technology pathway and our engineering pathway as our new pathways. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe it's it's an ongoing discussion. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be to determine. You have to first of all determine in that sector um, what pathway are you going to take. And you have to look at the labor market research. So I will tell you that the labor market research does not support performing arts but it supports um, theater arts as a profession. By, uh, for example, technology, theater technology. It supports um, um, digital music. So you have to look at what pathway the labor market research supports. First and foremost, that's how all your funds are funded. But then above that, if there's something else in our district that's a need or a want, then we have other funds. We can dedicate LCAP funds to it. But mm -hmm. you, there's a process to go through, which honestly, Maria, we just didn't get to this year um, because we were still strengthening our STEM pathway with engineering and biomedical technology at Central. But it's def definitely something that Dr. Farkas can um, can work through this year. Um, and he has a lot of support at IVROP as well as Denise Cabanilla at ICOB can help us um, really um, work through that and, de and develop that pathway. It does require the teachers to be able to have a CTE credential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we've been working currently with Dr. Bussey on his CTE credential. I know he's been working with um, IVROP. Um, but there we just. Yeah, and Mr. Spitero. But I mean, as far as the whole visual and performing arts yeah, pathway. I think it's Spitero. Yes. Yes, that's, my, that's Spitero. But we were looking at Dr. Bussey adding that under that same CTE pathway. But it's going to just take some work in what pathway in the sector do we want? What does it take? Do we ha Where can we get the funding? Because right now, um, Savatha is funded under the CPA, right? The California Partnership Academies. So what, can it still be funded under that? Does it need additional funding? And that just is going to take a little bit more work. It's definitely begun. It just wasn't completed this year. Thank you. But Dr. Farkas can check with us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank there was also um, a lot of interest from the feeder schools from that want to do the mariachi at. Yes. There's yes. a lot of interest in that at Heber and at Kennedy? Wilson, Kennedy, mm -hmm. and I believe Harding, but for sure um, Meadows and um, and Kennedy. And maybe Lincoln, because Lincoln is also another dual immersion mm -hmm. school, so they have a strong um, interest in, in, in the culture as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, the feeder schools, having the, them start in the feeder schools really makes a for a robust yes. program in the high school, and that's what's happened with our orchestra. They have it at McCabe, they have it at Wilson, mm -hmm. and so the students are ready by the time they get to Southwest to really kind of grow in the program. They're not starting from zero. Um, so I, I kind of really envision that happened yeah. with yes. mariachi. Yes. I mean, it started in 2018, the 2018-2019 school year, and I know COVID happened, so kind yes. of things stopped. But I think we really, we're ready to kind of mm -hmm. really ready to look. take the next step. Yeah. And labor market research isn't the only indicator of whether or not you, you can have, whether it's just some funding sources like Strong Workforce, Perkins, CTIG rely a lot on labor market research. And in your, in your particular county, is that industry marketable? Like, will your students be able to leave Southwest and get into a job in performing arts? Um, but that's not that's not the only indicator. It's just the biggest indicator for some of our funding sources. But like you said, we, we have money in LCAP. We have money coming from the state, hopefully, that's focusing on visual and performing arts, right? If if all of that goes through and that budget gets passed, there are a lot more. There are a lot of opportunities to focus that in. Um, we, just, we just need to continue the work that we started this year, as well as I believe in CTIG or Perkins. Um, there's a talk about. Um, working with our feeder schools and especially in some of our um, programs where they require in visual and performing arts actually, it's still going to be in CTG or Perkins, but um, where they require some of our students don't have the opportunities to have the leg up that others do 
because their parents can afford dance class, their parents mm -hmm. can afford um, cheerleading, and some can't. There was talk with Dr. Andrews, we were currently working on how do we then take our students down there to give them some lessons so they have a leg up when they come. So yeah, those discussions were had, but we didn't finish them. Okay. okay. Thank well, you. thank you You're very welcome. much. Any more questions for the LCAP? No? Do I hear motion to accept with the supplemental annual update? I'll make that motion to accept the LCAP with the revisions and updates. I'll second. I have a motion by Ms. Jones, second by Mr. Rodriguez. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Rana, for coming back. Mm -hmm. And welcome, Tricia. <laughs> that was a big welcome for you, huh? <laughs> Approve the revised uh, expanded learning opportunity grant for 2022-2023. So the revisions here, um, Trustee and Trustee Ruiz, is, as Tricia and Rosanna and I were looking at the funds we have remaining, mm -hmm. um, the expanded learning opportunity grant um, extends beyond this year. We had noticed that in some of our actions, we had spent most of the money, and in others, it was underspent. So we went through and we revised it to uh, move money from actions that were underspent into the actions that we were still using that had been spent, so that we can continue the services that were most needed this year in next year. Okay. So there's no additional funding, it's just a moving of funds, and some of, because it was a certain amount, over a certain amount of money, uh, and some of the funds we moved were in the hundreds of thousands of dollars from one action to the other. So we, we needed a broad action. Seat. Okay. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Ms. Jones, a second? I'll oh. second. Go ahead, okay. Curtis. Go uh, ahead. I'll second. Motion to approve uh, from Ms. Jones, second by Mr. Hernandez. All in favor? Aye. 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 I keep saying flavor. I don't know why. <laughs> I keep saying flavor for the whole year. Anyway, uh, we move on. Uh, approval of the personnel report from June 28, 2022. Do I hear Do motion? Do we need or anything on, mm. on it? It's for the, it's, it's, personnel. it's in their packet. Okay. No addition, no subtraction, right? No? Okay. Did we skip over um, the mm. V or five? Oh, the, oh, the local, local indicator, indicator report. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You can finish that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were on one. Do you want to finish that one first? Oh, let's go. Let's go in order. Okay. Yeah. Local indicator report. Uh, so as part of the LCAP process, um, <laughs> we're required every year to report on our local indicators. So uh, with the local control funding formula, with the LCFF, there are, there are measures that are measured at the state level, and then there are measures that are measured locally, and those are your local control indicators. Both of these indicators appear on the dashboard. So you can see the state indicators are four, five, six, and eight. So those are your academic indicators. Your, well, they call the LP, but we haven't had that indicator. It's the LPAC, the one that Patty's in charge of. You'll see the chronic absence indicator, the graduation rate indicator, suspension and college and career readiness indicator will all show up on the dashboard again eventually. They're not there right now. Um, but these are the local indicators. And really with the local indicators, we, we only have their standards met, standards not met, or standards not met for more than three years. We are always in standards met because if you do your surveys, if you analyze your data, if you report it out, then, you can, then your standards met. You're doing what was required of you. So we're gonna see tonight some information on our basic services, teachers, instructional materials and facilities, standard two, the implementation of state standards, um, standard seven, course of access, and standard three, parent engagement, I skipped that one. And parent engagement, and you'll see, is much more than just do parents come to assemblies? Do parents come to our musicals? Do they attend our events? It's do parents feel that they are active decision makers here in our district. So this is the most, this is what the dashboard looks like. And you'll see that they have them across the bottom, basic, basic services, implementation of academic standards, parent and family engagement, our local climate survey, which actually is part of um, so number six, and our access to broad course of study. <laughs> So those are the areas you will see on the dashboard. If you were to look at the California State Dashboard, you will see these here for 2021. 
So this is priority one basic. So um, at this point in time, we had zero reported misassignments and a misassignment is a teacher teaching out of their credential area. So for example, if um, Carol were to do her report and she saw that we had an English teacher teaching math, that's a misassignment. If we had a teacher teaching ELD without the CLAD or the proper ELD certification, that's a misassignment. So we had zero misassignments at the time of this report. We had zero students uh, without access to their own copies of instructional materials. That was at our um, in, uh, sufficiency of instructional materials. We did that back in the fall. And this year we did our FIT, uh, Arnold and his team did the FIT, the facilities inspection tool on each of our campuses. Uh, Phoenix Rising had one deficiency, Desert Oasis had seven, Southwest had eight, and Central had six for a total of 22 deficiencies, a much lower number than last year. We were at about 66. But again, we didn't have students on campus at that time, but starting the school year, our deficiency had lowered significantly. So priority two is the implement, implementation of state academic standards. We have to annually measure our progress towards implementing state academic standards and report it to our governing board. This report has to occur at the same meeting where the LCAP is approved, which is why it's tonight. So we looked at the, um, our progress in providing professional learning for teaching to the recently adopted academic standards. In ELA, we felt like we were at a four, a full implementation. We know that our English teachers are attending training offered by ACOE, district staff. We have ERWC training. Um, our teacher teams met to create assignments and align curriculum this year. In ELD, we felt we were at a four. We keep, Patty's doing a great job of providing that ongoing ELD training to our staff, not only our ELD staff, but our, our core content area staff as well. In math, we felt like we were at a three in initial implementation. We had some work this year begin with special ed in the math department to really bring those specialized courses into alignment with the grade level. So we have some professional development work to still do there. Of course, with our science standards, it's ongoing, right? There's so much to learn in science as we add new courses. So we're in that initial implementation. And then in history, social science, we had some new materials that prompted training around the standards. So we're there um, at that full implementation level. This is um, instructional materials that are aligned to the recently adopted academic standards. Our NELA, all of our materials are aligned to the most recent standards. Um, in ELD, our, our materials are aligned. And in math, our materials are aligned. Where we really need the work is in science and social science. We have some courses in science that they're not using any curriculum. It's all teacher created sources. Um, there's no continuity in those materials and also our special education department reports that they don't always have the same science textbooks as the general education classes. And so we've been working on that this year. In history and social science, we did find some classes uh, with materials from the 90s uh, in history. There's a lot of history that happened between the 90s and today. So we wanna make sure that we are uh, really working on all of our materials and social studies coming up and being aligned to the most current adoption. Again, you know, it's, again, it's just, it is what it is, right, data, it is what, we know, we're, we know the places we need to work. One is in our special ed department, being part of the curriculum adoption and getting the same materials uh, to modify and work with the students, and the other, we have some, some concerns in history um, as well in social, in uh, the special education department. So priority two, this is about um, implementing policies or programs to support staff in identifying areas where they can improve. Um, overall, we felt in ELA and ELD, that's where we are the strongest. We have evaluations, we do our minimum days Wednesdays. We had done some instructional rounds, especially with new teachers. In ELD um, is all staff. This year we've been training um, all teachers and ELD standards uh, um, by um, volunteers, right? Who wants the training? And Patty's done a great job with that. In math, we really need to do some more targeted data analysis to see where we need the professional development. As you know, our math scores are low, right? Um, especially with our students learning English and our students in special education. So we really need to dig deep into that data and see is there professional development that we're missing? How can we support our staff to deliver instruction and how can we bring our, our scores up? The same with the science test. And we have had some work with the science teams meaning to revise their assessments and social studies, again, um, they've done some work, but we really focused with social studies this year on get focused, stay focused, the piece that they were supporting there. So we're well on our way. We just feel that our biggest area of need is in math. This is implementing each of the academic standards in these areas, so CTE, health, PE, visual and performing arts, and world language. 
Again, um, we have world language, CTE, and health. We're very strong. We've done a lot of work in those areas. We still need to do a little bit more work in PE and visual and performing arts as we've noticed that there's not a consistency across the district, so we just feel that we need to do some work in those areas. And this is um, for uh, school administrators and teachers during the school year. Um, we really feel that our area here that we need to work on is providing support for teachers on the standards they have not yet mastered. So we feel like as an admin team that we really need to focus in on um, our teachers and where they are. We've done a lot of really good across the board training, but we need some more focused training if we're going to support our teachers to support our students. So these are our areas of strength. Um, analyzing data in the area of English and science, they've done a lot of work on that this year in their CAT teams. Providing materials in support of curriculum for all teachers. We do have some, some areas of need, but overall everybody has curriculum. Uh, provide time and training for collaboration around the standards. We do a lot of training, but we've done a lot of talk. We need to now give them that time to analyze that training and look at their data. So PD opportunities are readily available, our instructional support team, we have some in-house professional development systems, and our IST sends out a lot of surveys to get feedback. Our areas of growth are really continue that focus on standards driving instruction, trying rather than trying to fit what we do into the standards. We've always done this, how does it fit in the standards, when we really need to, to continue working on this is what the standard says, how are we going to teach that standard. Making sure materials are provided in a timely manner, uh, we need to improve that ongoing follow-up professional development. We really need to work on using data. We went two years without a lot of data, right? 1920, 2021, we had limited data. It's time to get our hands back on that data. And our teachers can't make good decisions with data if we don't get it to them. So we need to find a way to get the data into the hands of our teachers so they can make the decisions that they're trained to make. If, they're, if they don't have the data, they're making decisions um, just based on what they're seeing every day, but they're not able to dig deep and make the decisions I know they're capable of making. We need to keep our focus on our combinations and supports. Our two, tar our two target groups of students that, that have the biggest gaps, students learning English and students with IEPs. We've got to focus on accommodations and supports in the general education setting. And then really formalize discussions around needs for professional development by administration. So really, we, we really talked a lot about getting with your staff and saying, what are the needs of your department? We take a lot of things to them, but it's time we start doing more of what does your department need? Let's, now, let's give that to you. So really kind of formalizing those discussions. Priority three, this is parent and family engagement. We have a self-reflection tool that we send out to our parents. So you can see, um, that they still, we still have some work to do in supporting staff to learn about each family's strengths, cultures, languages, and goals. And we um, have some work to do in multiple opportunities for engaging in two-way communication. We don't have a lot of our families using our two-way communication tools, so we need to really work on how can we improve that. We're strongest in welcoming environments. That was loud and clear from our educational partners. Um, and we're doing a good job in building trust and respectful relationship with families, but Having staff know more about families, it came out over and over again, I wish the teachers knew more about my mental health. I wish the teachers knew more about what my, you know, my family does or, or from parents as well. And then two-way communication, we need to just continue. Communication for our district is our, should be our number one goal across the board. This came up in our educational partner feedback with classified, this came up with administration, this came up with certificated, it came up with students and it came up with parents. So it's something we definitely need to work on across the board. <clears throat> so our current strengths, uh, we've adopted multiple programs to open communication line with students and parents. Um, in each at Promise House advisory class, the teachers are making weekly phone calls home. Dr. Andrews sends out monthly videos on social media. Parent University was instituted to train parents how they can support their students and their own personal growth. Uh, and we update our websites on a regular basis. Again, we need more interactive two-way communication, PD for staff with regard to relationship building and availability of staff before and after hours were some of the things that we needed. But again, communication in general was very um, strong in all of our surveys. So this is another, this one is about building partnerships. Again, um, it, we came out, our, our lower we came out at uh, beginning development in providing professional learning and support to teachers and principals to improve a school's capacity to partner with families. Specifically, how do we partner with families? How do we reach those families? We were strong in providing families with information. We're really good at that. 
We were, we were at full implementation and supporting families to understand and exercise their legal rights and advocate. Um, and we were at the initial stages and implementing policies or programs for teachers to meet with families and students to discuss student progress. So again, it's that how do we partner with families uh, that we, an, an area of, of need for us. So here's our strengths. CUHC families always share how friendly our office staff is. That was very clear. Welcoming environments was clear. The portals are available and training is provided to ensure stakeholders know how to access information. They're not all accessing it though. Uh, teachers update their grade books at least every other week. Parent teacher conferences are always available. Social emotional staff have been hired to address the recent needs of students. Referrals for SEL to outside organizations are made when necessary. And by the way, thank you very much for adding the additional student mental health specialist today. That'll provide a full-time mental health specialist to Desert Oasis and Phoenix Rising and a .5 to Mount Signal. The students at Desert Oasis loud and clear said they did not have enough time with their mental health uh, specialists. So I'm really happy that we're able to offer that. Our areas of focus is providing families with training and support in their rights and responsibilities. And we know that if we educate them, they'll, feel, they'll be more apt to want to participate in our decision-making process. This uh, is seeking input from parents. So again, one of our areas of need are um, family members effectively engage in advisory and decision-making. If you, a lot of our parents come to our advisory meetings, but they don't feel, in my focus groups that I had with them, unless I asked specific questions and I could get them, I get it out of them, I don't think they have the confidence yet to say, this is what I need. This is what I think we should do. So it's an area that shows that we really need to work with them, knowing that we need them to help us make these decisions, that they're a vital part of the decisions we make in our district. We're at the initial implementation in uh, principals and staff effectively engaging in advisory groups with decision making and opportunities to provide input. And then our strongest areas, family, teachers, principals, and district administrators work together to plan, design, implement, and evaluate family engagement activities. So again, it's that making our parents feel capable of being part of our decision-making processes, which in the state of California is mandatory, right? That they're part of it. Um, so our strengths, we hold multiple meetings through various means. We have surveys for parents, students, and teachers. Various topics have been covered in meetings. Uh, meetings are held in English and Spanish. We have an open door policy for administrators. And our area of focus is determining how to engage more families from underrepresented families. And this is overall some of the th same things, creating welcoming environments, multiple opportunities for two-way communication, um, information and resources, and uh, ability to provide input. So our areas of growth, capacity to build trust and respectful relationships, professional learning opportunities for staff, capacity with principals and staff to engage families, and then building family members' capacity to effectively engage in decision making. So priority six is school climate. This year we administered the California Healthy Kids Survey to students in grades nine and 11 at all four of our campuses, all one, two, three, four, five of our campuses. So our data reflects, this is some of our data. So school connectedness, we notice a distinct uh, difference between our students that were in person, their connectedness to our students that are remote and their connectedness. So 59% of our students attending in person felt connected, but only 46% of our students attending remotely felt connected. 64% um, of our students were academically motivated. And again, it's of those surveyed in grades 9 and 11. 30% were able to maintain focus on schoolwork. 53% experienced a caring adult relationship. So just looking at those numbers, it just goes to show that we need to still work on, especially goal four in the LCAP, which is school connectedness and belonging, that there's some work we need to do there. 61% of our students perceived our school to be safe. 25% experienced harassment or bullying. So again, that looks like a low number, but that means one in four students experienced harassment or bullying when you put it a different way, right? So again, we need some work there. Again, which this goes to uh, goal five in our LCAP on safety, right? So our data supports that, that action in goal five. We did notice that the pandemic had a negative effect on the social and emotional health of our students, and this carried over to this year. 32% of our students, uh, one in three, experienced social emotional distress. Four out of 10 experienced chronic sadness or hopelessness and 15% considered suicide. So 1.5 out of every 10 of our students considered suicide. Again, this goes to social emotional well-being. This goes to the school-based mental health specialists. This goes to the calming rooms, the crisis centers, 
how important they are. This data, this data directly supports the actions that we have in our LCAP. Alcohol and drug use, again, continues to be higher in 11th grade. 22% of our 11th graders reported using alcohol or drugs in the last 30 days, so one in five. 8% um, reported being very drunk or high at least seven times in the last 30 days. And then 10% reported vaping. So one out of every 10 is vaping currently in the 11th grade. Cigarette and vapes are readily available. So 21% reported that cigarettes are very easy to obtain and 32% reported that vape products are very easy to pertain. That's 9th and 11th grade together. Just the 11th grade, 51% of our 11th graders said vape was very readily available for them. Um, at this time, I still can't disaggregate the data by, I, I wanted to disaggregate the data, Trish and I tried by um, students who are low income, students who are foster youth, it's just not available in the California Healthy Kids survey. It is in PASS, which is another survey we could use, but the one we currently have, it's not. Um, so our 11th grade Latinx students experience chronic sadness and hopelessness more than two times as often. It's uh, a lot of our, um, more of our students in the Latinx community are also low income. They're also English learners, so you can make that connection. Um, we still have that significant difference between gender identities. Non-binary students are less academically motivated. 11th grade females had twice as many rumors spread about them as males. Obviously, that's not um, uncommon. I mean, girls tend to fight socially, mentally, boys fight physically. Ninth grade females had two times less rumors spread than males. Ninth grade males are two times more afraid of being beaten up than females. Again, our females fight in social media. They take their hits in social media. They take their hits in text. They take their hits um, in TikTok. They, they take their hits much more phys mentally than they do physically. Our males were in fights five times more than females, and more females than males use drugs, tobacco, and alcohol. Um, so the... That was a good data. Um, so we've implemented, uh, we're still looking to provide that youth mental health first aid training. It's very important. We were unable to do it this year. No one offered it. Um, currently, Scott at um, Behavioral Health says that he now can offer it, so we were working on providing that. We still need some type of a district-wide social-emotional learning program. We have great social-emotional learning program at Southwest. We have a great social-emotional learning program at Central. We have good social emotional learning going on at Desert Oasis and Phoenix Rising. We do not have Central Union High School District umbrella. This is what every student in Central Union High School District gets for social emotional learning. And then each site can kind of take their own take on it. But we still need to look at something that we can say every student in Central Union High School District under social emotional learning will get, you know, these things. things. Um, we have designated counselors that are provided to our most at risk students. Last year we added a counselor at uh, Phoenix Rising. Drug intervention education services, we did, um, do you remember the name of that program, Too Cool for Drugs and Violence? The one that they did at Southwest, you weren't part of it. I think it's Too Cool for Drugs and Violence. There was a program we did last year, and the name's escaping me, that we trained staff in how to use, and they were using that program after school. We do have a strong partnership with Imperial County Behavioral Health. Uh, we're still working on that partnership. We now have a strong partnership with ICOE, um, with our student mental health specialists. Anti-vaping campaigns will be in place. It's one area we need to focus on. Dr. Andrus, when he first got here, if you remember, did a big anti-vaping campaign. We were home for the pandemic. We really need to bring that back. As you can yeah. see, 51% of our juniors say that vape is readily available. And they're not always vaping tobacco in their vape pens. That's right. They have a little right. HTC. Yes. Well, yeah. That um, Heidi Rodriguez is one of the peacekeepers mm -hmm. teachers and I know she did a fantastic project with her students yes so I'm wondering if she can come and present and uh, maybe in the August board meeting yep. or uh, some board meeting soon regarding that project because I think they did some wonderful work and I'm wondering if it's something that can be expanded and not just kept at, at central she's also doing another project and, and the name escapes me do you remember that no, not to JCL, the new one, where they bring together student people from different cultures to get to know each other. Um, I'll have her talked about, but definitely we can ask Heidi to come in August, Tricia. Would you like that to be in a board study session or in the open meeting? I think an open meeting. Open meeting, okay. Okay, yeah, we can do that. And I think what really impacted our, um, some of our student belonging is we put 
the job of increasing school spirit and increasing student belonging in the hands of the people that know it the most. We put it in the hands of our students this year. Dr. Andrus was so smart in creating these student voice projects. Each campus got money to do what their campus needed. They all focused on mental health. They all focused on student belonging. They all focused on caring about each other. So we put both student voice projects and ARC into our LCAP for ongoing funding because they were so successful this year. ARC is what you mentioned. It's one of the best things to happen to Desert Oasis, right? Desert Oasis and Phoenix Rising, I, you know, it has been the best thing to happen there. It's been great at Central, it's been great at Southwest, but at Desert Oasis and Phoenix Rising, those students now feel like they go to a real school. Where before they would tell me, we feel like the throwaway kids, Miss Fox, why are we here? Oh, Miss Fox, you know what we are over here. We're just the kids that nobody wants. I mean, come on. They're, now they say, we love our school. We're gonna get Phoenix Rising more involved and we went on this field trip and now we have sports. And so they really feel like what we've told them all along, you're there because you need more support. We care about you more because you're getting more really than other students and with ARC they now have that sense of belonging and that sense of school spirit. Another thing um, that Fernando had asked me which is not indicated here is that we also did um, that Arnold did was he allowed each school to buy swag. Desert Oasis and Phoenix Rising those students wore their t-shirts carried their sling bags all year long and so Fernando and I were looking and there are places in the El Cap where we can, that was Arnold's idea last year to increase belonging as we're coming out of the pandemic. Great small budget items that really made a difference um, at all of the schools, but especially at our, at our most targeted schools, which Phoenix Rising and Desert Oasis. So broad course of study, priority seven. Um, we had to ask what locally selected measures or tools do we have to track the extent to which our students have access to a broad course of study. So we have our four-year plan, our 10-year plan, we have academic plans and areas. We're having a growing course list. Every year we're adding new courses to meet the needs of our students. We're getting ready to resequence our courses in special ed to provide a broader course of study to our students in math and English and science there. We have student surveys regarding course requests, ARIES reports, um, ARIES analytics, especially Desert Oasis and Phoenix Rising really use those reports. Um, psychologist reports, academic, academic functioning scores for SVED students and our CalPADS report all help us determine whether or not our students actually have a broad course of study. So this is the extent to which all students have access to and are enrolled in a broad course of study. Um, we adopted a CELIS this year as an alternative form of credit recovery uh, to allow our students um, to access courses in another way. We've broadened all of our CTE pathways to the demands of programs. We've added programs like At Promise House and the Virtual Academy to meet students' needs. Um, but again, um, one of our, again, one of our areas that's not mentioned here, but one of our areas of need is to ensure that our students learn, uh, learning English and our students um, with IEPs have access to more extended courses like visual and performing arts and like our advanced courses. So uh, these are our barriers. So again, we talked about this in our board study session. Our biggest barrier is time for our students. We have a six period day. Um, there are so many core classes, especially our freshmen and sophomores that they're required to take that they just don't have room in their schedule to take some of these courses. They're required by law in ELD to take an ELD class. Our students with IEPs have an academic support classes. So there just is not room for them. That's one of our biggest barriers to, the, to access for some of our students. Um, staffing, uh, we don't have enough teachers to fill certain pathway requests, especially we're still struggling at Desert Oasis for a CTE teacher. We were struggling to fill our Ag Mechanics course, um, but we actually have supplemented some of that with our dual enrollment courses. And our facilities are still an issue, right? We're still short space. There's so many great things we could do in some of our courses. We just don't have the room right now for them. Um, and socioeconomic barriers, this is the one I was mentioning uh, to you, Maria. I knew it was somewhere. Socioeconomic barriers that keep students from making the cut for certain classes like Savapa. So low-income students don't make the cut because they haven't taken dance classes prior to high school was one example that some of, some of them had mentioned. Um, and again, it's some work that we need to do on making sure we brought it. And it could go to creating a different pathway, right? This is dance classes for students who have had before. These are dance classes for not. And we try to do that with our dance PE, but it doesn't always translate into SABAPA. Um, and then um, what revisions, decisions, or actions? And we're gonna explore avenues that permit us to expand both in staffing availability of courses and access to courses. So we just have some work to do in figuring out how we can make that happen with the limitations we currently have. 
So uh, Trisha will now upload this. I'll help her with that when she needs my help. It goes uploaded into the dashboard and you click on it and this information will be there. It's currently there for 2021. And usually they say late August, but now I'm hearing it could be September, October. So whenever the, the state says August, I count on October. If they say September, I count on November because there always seems to be a delay at the state for reporting or implementing things. Any questions? Speaking of the facilities, not enough. Is there any way we could take the trailers around the central campus and spread those out to some of the other places so they have a room? Currently, we're using um, almost all of those trailers. But aren't they going to, some of those teachers going to go elsewhere? Right now, we're housing Mount Signal Virtual Academy there. That's taking oh, up okay. three uh, or four yeah, trailers. Yeah, got it. Um, we're housing um, at Promise House in the trailers, and I believe that's six trailers. ARC is there. That's another two trailers. And we do still have some staff there as well. Um, okay. I th we've been talking about expanding facilities here at Phoenix Rising um, because eventually, at Promise House will probably blend with Phoenix Rising because there won't be as big of a need uh, at the comprehensive site. And Arnold and I have had discussions regarding trailers here, trailers there. Um, you know that somewhere in the future we are, could build a new school. Uh, you know, we're looking at building a farm on our property out there so that we can um, have not have our cows running around Southwest. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, but yeah, it would be in theory, Emma, it would be great. We can move them, but I think Arnold, but how I, many I, of them I are? Get, I forgot, I forgot we yeah. were using all those for those. Do you have any answer to that, Arnold? I think all of them are going to be in use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're leasing some of them, correct? Uh, all of them. 18, we own six. Okay. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, there's six closest to the fence to the west the rest of the traders are leased they are required to go back to the state uh, within a three-year period Ooh, we're running out of time mm -hmm. yeah. okay. any, any other questions thank you thank you thank you very much of course So now we move on to the approval of the personnel report, June 28, 2020. No, it's just a report, right? It's just a report, correct? Yeah, yeah, it's just a report. So, uh, approval of the personnel report, motion? So moved. Jones, do I hear a second? I'll second. Second. For the approval of the personnel report, June 28, 2022, we have a motion by Ms. Jones, second by Ms. Peinado. All in favor? Aye. 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 Move on to variable term waiver request, waiver of Ed Code 44253.11, waiver of certificate of completion to staff development to provide instruction to English learners. Do we have to mention the teachers or they're just in the report? No? Just, just, okay. Do I hear a motion? I'll make a motion for, to approve the variable term waiver request. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a uh, motion by Ms. Jones, second by Mr. Rodriguez. All in favor? Aye. 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 Public notice and approval of intent to employ certificated applicants under the provisional internship permit. I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the intent to employ our PIPs. Mm -hmm. Second. I'll second Ms. Uh, Ms. Garcia. Mm -hmm. Motion by Ms. Jones, second by Mr. Hernandez. All in favor? Aye. 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 Move on to approval of new salary for health services coordinator nurse in addition to supplement its stipend for summer school principal. So this is the two, right? The health services coordinator and the addition of the supplemental stipend for the, right? There's two. Yeah. So is there, each site has their coordinator, the health coordinator, or is it just one? It's just one, oh, okay. So I'll make a motion for approval of new salary for health services coordinator nurse 
I'll and second. In oh. addition of supplemental statement by summer school principal. Okay, so we have a motion by Peinado. Second, second by Ms. Jones. All in favor? Aye. 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 Move on to approval to increase credit card limits with Mechanics Bank. I make a motion that we approve the Don't increase the limit because I know that we had trouble on getting enough uh, credit to send people on different trips. Yeah. <laughs> a second? Uh, I'll second, second. Mr. Garcia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Motion by Ms. Jones is second by Mr. Hernandez. Any, f um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Approval to remove current superintendent and add incoming superintendent to mechanics bank account and issue new credit card for superintendent. I'll make a motion we take Dr. Adver's name off and <laughs> <laughs> add Dr. Parker to it. <laughs> <laughs> Do I hear a second? Boy, I'll that second. was quick, huh? <laughs> <laughs> easy cut, that easy go. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rodriguez second. Mr. Rodriguez, second. All, all in favor? Aye. 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 Adopt resolution 06282-24 of the Central Union High School District authorizing temporary cash transfers for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. I'll make a motion that we adopt the transfers, the resolution for the transfers. Second? I'll second. Second by Ms. Peinado. Roll call vote, correct? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, request the board approve the 2021-2022 estimated actuals and the proposed 2022-2023 adopted budget. Do we have anything to add to last m board meeting's budget? There is nothing. Nothing to add. No changes. Okay. Any questions for before we adopt? No? Okay. I need a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve the, the estimated actuals as presented. Second. Do I hear a second? I'll second Ms. Garcia. Mr. Hernandez. Motion by Ms. Jones. Second by Mr. Hernandez. All in favor? Aye. 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 No informational items. I see Mr. Duenas, EC, STA comments? I have no comments. None? Do we have anybody from CSCA? No? no? Okay. Thank you. There's no closed session, so that ends our meeting at 7.37 p.m.